Hello, everybody. My name is Bruce Momgen. I'm a pleasure to be here to speak to you today about uh, the Postgres Lock Manager. Because of uh, some uh, overages of time uh, from the sponsors this morning, I will only have 40 minutes to present this. Uh, the original presentation time was an hour, so I will have to be quicker than usual. Uh, basically, this means I have to finish by uh, 11.20 today because the next session starts at 11.30, which again, the break has been sort of eliminated. So uh, I am going to start on time. I'm going to do my best to get through as many slides as I can. Uh, I do have 108 slides, so um, be prepared. Uh, I have given another talk similar to this last year. Uh, the description that I got was that it was like a roller coaster ride. Uh, they did learn a lot, but they also where their heads were going to explode. So uh, I'll try not to have any exploding heads here, but um, this will be a lot of material, and it will be delivered uh, fairly briefly. I would love to take questions. Uh, so even though I know I'm sounds like I'm flying through things, I think questions are very important because if you have a question, odds are someone else does. So let's get started. Um, locking. No one likes locking. Uh, just like really nobody likes going to the dentist or it's not high on your list of things to do. Um, you have to do locking for the database to operate efficiently and for uh, the database to operate consistently. So uh, this is sort of like, you know, not like going to the dentist, but basically it's, uh, it's not an exciting topic, but I think it's an important topic. This is the outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, first, I'm going to be talking about uh, an introduction to locking, kind of go over some of the basics, uh, real, real basic. Then I'm going to talk about transaction identifiers. Again, that doesn't seem like it would have anything to do with locking, but in fact, it's quite important. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about the different types of locks. Postgres supports a dizzying number of lock types, uh, which I will try and communicate to you in a humorous way. Um, and then finally, I'm going to show some lock examples. I think that last part is probably the most interesting because we actually show you some queries that actually have locks. Um, and you can see some stuff that, again, you should be able to see on your live systems. Any questions? OK, great. Introduction. Uh, introduction of locking. I think this guy's kind of funny, so earnest looking. You know. um, so how many people have played the text adventure game? Uh, if anybody who has ever heard the term XYZZY, that's where it came from. Uh, it was basically a little special code in there. And there was a part in the game where you got stuck in a maze. Uh, and I've, anybody, how many people have, is this familiar to? Oh, man, am I that old? Come on, all right. So <clears throat> I guess I am. Um, so this was a, where you get stuck, and you look at it, and you're going to realize that these te this text is all a little different. And in fact, you had to kind of map the little strings to figure out which ones were actually getting you farther and which ones were kind of going in circles. Uh, if you got stuck in this part, it was, it was fairly painful, and I often got confused. Um, so how does that, what does that have to do with Postgres? Postgres supports a similarly dizzying and confusing number of lock types. Um, share update exclusive, share row exclusive, twisty little passages, access exclusive, row share, access share. Row exclusive, OK? I've just named different row types, although they all kind of sound the same. Um, I'm not happy about this. this. I believe these are the names that Oracle uses. And we basically adopted them. And we couldn't think of anything better. Uh, but it's not a fun thing. Uh, and, and you sort of have to brace yourself when I start to look at these names to remember, like, was that row share exclusive or row exclusive twisty passages? I, I can't remember. OK. Um, there is a pattern. Uh, basically, in this example, you can see all of the share items are in red. That means that mobile people can take the same lock. Uh, the exclusive ones are in blue. So there is a kind of a pattern here. Um, in addition, some of them are row locks. So some of them are locks on rows. And you can see those in purple. Uh, other ones are in green. Uh, those are access locks. So again, there is kind of a pattern, but you have to be uh, sort of twisty little passages aware uh, when you're doing it, and they all kind of sound the same. Another thing I'm going to be, I should really bring up is MVCC. I do have a very successful MVCC talk that 
Uh, I have given it a number of conferences last year. If you're interested, uh, it is actually on my website, and there's a recording on the Enterprise DB website uh, of this. By the way, I'm an Enterprise DB employee. They've been hired me for five years. Uh, but I do mostly community work, which is super cool. Um, MVCC basically is the, the system Postgres allow, the, Postgres has designed um, or has adopted to, to allow high concurrency. It involves uh, the fact that updates create a second copy of the row instead of replacing the row in place. Those of you who use pre-MVC system, pre systems are familiar with cases where if you do an update, like all the selects stop working until the update completes or dirty reads, stuff like that. We don't have that. Um, I can't go into that. Uh, that's another talk, topic for another talk, but again, uh, that actually is on my website. Um, speaking of my website, I should have mentioned it. It's right here. And I'm sorry, the pointer on this thing is super hard to see. And I do not, oh, I do. I do have my super duper pointer with me, which of course is going to make everyone happy. There. Oh, that's not much better, but there. That's my website right there. Uh, there are over 30 presentations, uh, including this one. And I put this presentation up this morning, so it's there if you want to download it right now. Uh, these are Creative Common Attribute License, and again, uh, I am an Enterprise DB employee, and Enterprise DB has recorded a lot of these things as webcasts. So if you kind of want, to, if you see a presentation you're interested in, try looking at the Enterprise DB website. You might find there's a webcast that you can hear me babbling on and on about the slide. It makes it a little more interesting. Um, okay, any questions about the intro? Everyone's totally confused. Okay, um, transaction identifiers. Um, we have to understand transaction identifiers because those are actually involved in some of the later slides. Um, another thing about this slide deck, keep your eye on the red text. Okay? Um, you're going to see a lot of text on these screens. Uh, make sure you look at the colored text because that's really where the, the, t the, the part you should be looking at. Um, I know a lot of people kind of forget. For example, in this slide, you should be looking here. Okay, I know this slide's kind of trivial, but as you get into more and more slides, you're going to realize that it does get kind of complicated. Okay, um, one way of identifying uh, a process is with the process identifier. We do have a function that allows you to look at that. Uh, that actually is a process identifier right there. Uh, we have something called virtual transaction IDs or virtual X IDs. Um, X meaning trans. I know it's really kind of a reach, but X means trans, so X ID is trans ID or transaction ID. Um, basically, uh, this, is a tr this is a virtual transaction ID right here. Um, it's made up of two parts. The first part, part is the back end number. The second part is the virtual transaction ID within that back end. Again, just remember that if you see a number with a slash, that's probably what it means. Um, back end slot numbers, you can actually look at your own back end slot number using this. Uh, this query right here. Um, here's an example of the virtual transaction ID increasing. Here it's 2 slash 10, here's 2 slash 11. So you can see it kind of increments like that. And finally, um, there is something called a virtual, or a, I'm, I'm sorry, a real transaction ID, an external transaction ID, a non-virtual transaction ID. Um, this is a virtual one, uh, but if you run a command, you can actually see the real transaction ID that is associated with this statement, uh, with this session. Um, virtual transaction IDs only get virtual uh, transaction IDs to start, and then they might get real transaction IDs if they actually modify some data. So we're basically looking at three identifiers. The process ID, the virtual transaction ID, and then uh, finally the real transaction ID right here. Okay. If any of you have any questions about these queries, the queries are actually all right here. So if, if at some point later you want to actually run these queries, just download that SQL, pipe it in, it'll run just fine. Okay, so just like the MVCC talk, you can, I'm not making any of this up. This is actually captures from actual sessions that have been run. Okay. Um, one interesting idea, uh, aspect of real transaction ideas is you don't have one until you ask for one. When you ask for one, you basically get a real transaction ID. Um, the reason the virtual transaction IDs are there is basically read-only queries only get a virtual transaction ID. Okay. Questions? I'm doing terribly or very well. Okay. 
Um, lock types. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to go through the various lock types of Postgres. I'm going to show examples of each. Um, I'm going to show an example of me explicitly using the lock and then an implicit use of that particular lock type. Okay? Uh, again, a lot of locks here. Somehow putting locks on bridges uh, by, by couples, loving couples, is some big thing. Yes? Please. It is, it is um, basically when you set max connections to 100, you have, you have, you have, you have 100 slots at that point. So it, it, I really think of it as a proc ID slot. Um, and, and basically, your, your, your back end slot number is not going to change during your session. Your virtual one is going to increment like that. And again, it's virtual because nobody else sees it outside your, your individual session. Great. Other questions? OK. I haven't, I haven't asked anything question worthy, I guess. OK. Um, to get started, I did create a view um, that I'm going to use during this presentation. It's actually a view that is on top of another view, a virtual view called PG Locks. How many people have heard of PG Locks before? Great. OK, so PG Locks is effectively the way Postgres communicates lock information to users. However, it is fairly hard to understand. Um, I had great trouble understanding it. Let's put it that way. So what I've done is to create sort of a, a view on top of that that gives a better way of presenting PG locks for this particular presentation. And you might find for your uses it actually does a better job. So again, this SQL is in that, this query is in that SQL file I gave you. Uh, feel free to use it. Feel free to give me some improvements, OK? So we actually have a PG lock view table that uh, is, is sort of fundamental to what we're doing here. Um, I also have a lock view one table and a lock view two table. The only difference between those two is the PG lock view is too wide to show on my screen. Okay? So often you're going to see lock view one and then lock view two underneath it just so you can see the text. Is this text big enough for everybody? One's okay. I made it as big as I could. <laughs> okay. Um, lock view one, lock view two. Okay. Um, we also have a lock demo table has one row in it. Again, just very basic, you know, kind of intro stuff. Okay. So first doc type I'm going to talk about access share. You probably saw it way back here. Access share. So I'm basically going to go through this list here, okay, and show you some examples of all the locks. So um, access, and again, uh, keep your eye on the red because that's where you should be looking. Uh, we basically create a table. We insert one row into it and kind of get ready to go. So here I actually explicitly assign an access share lock on lock demo. Okay? Um, notice I had to do that in a multi-statement transaction. The reason you do that is because if you do the lock outside of a multi-statement transaction, the lock locks and then unlocks right away. Right? So does that make sense to everybody? Like, locking something outside of a, of a transaction block isn't use, very useful because you're, you're gaining the lock and then you're losing it right away as soon as the statement ends. So you're going to see most of the things I do are in a begin work block. Okay. So I basically lock the table and then I do a select on lock view one. Um, by the way, I'm actually doing the select in, uh, in, a, in a separate process. There's some reasons for that, which I'm not going to go into. Um, so here actually is the output of the, uh, of the lock view one. You can see I have a lock on the lock demo relation, and I have an access share lock, which is exactly what I've asked for. Uh, in addition, I have some numbers here. I have the process ID of my session. Okay, we talked about that already, right? And I have the virtual ID of my session, which we talked about already. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Great, good, good, good. Okay, second case. Uh, oh, here, I'm sorry, here's lock view two, where I'm actually using the second. I'm showing the second part. But you know, most cases, lock view does, two doesn't have anything in it. So I'm not actually going to show you lock view two unless you actually need it. OK, so just kind of pretend it's there, but I, I'm not going to show it a lot of times. Because if it doesn't have anything interesting, in this case, normally these fields would be filled in if there was something interesting. But there's nothing interesting. So we're just not going to show it in the slides. Okay. So here's our first real access share lock. Uh, it's implicit, meaning I'm not issuing a lock command. I'm letting SQL commands do it, non-lock commands. So here I start, I do begin work, and I actually do a select from the table. 
Okay, again, read only, uh, and I'm doing a select. So you'd think, oh, well, that's not going to lock anything. Well, it has to kind of lock some stuff because uh, you don't want that table like disappearing while you're selecting from it and stuff like that. Uh, so it's a very, very light lock. And from the name, you can kind of guess it. It's access lock and it's shared. So it's not an exclusive lock at all. It's something that has just basically blocks only a couple very fundamental operations while uh, this query is being run. Okay, but, it, but if you start to look at your system, you start to recognize, oh, access share lock, that's sort of a lightweight lock, and then there's some heavier locks that are actually more of a concern usually, and you, you need to kind of start to filter that information um, as you go through uh, this presentation. Okay? Um, here's another case, another example. Um, I'm actually doing a join on two tables here. Okay, that's a, uh, three tables, I'm sorry, that's an ANSI join on three tables. Again, I've moved to blue here, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and what you actually see here is that we have a whole bunch of access shared locks. Uh, again, that's the lowest level lock that we can have, possibly have. And you can see I've actually locked a whole bunch of things here. So a lot of the trick with, when trying to analyze locking is sort of get some of the stuff out of the way. Because you, a lot of these queries, a lot of these statements are going to have a lot of stuff you don't want to see. Because you're like, oh, access share lock, that's not important. It's not something I'm, I need to be concerned about. And again, you can actually use where clauses and things to filter out some of the stuff from the lock table that you, you're not interested in. Okay? What's interesting is that not only has it locked the tables that I'm interested in, it's actually locked the indexes as well uh, that are on top of the tables that I'm interested in. Okay? So I've actually got nine, row, nine locks from just one select statement that again referenced three tables and each table had, had two indexes on it. Yes? Yes, so the question is, um, can selecting for PG locks actually take some locks? One of the reasons that I'm actually using an external query to run the view is because in the view itself, that's a great question. I'm sorry, did I, everyone hear that? Did I repeat it loudly enough? So the question is, he's heard that selecting for PG locks actually takes its own locks. And he's wondering how that works or how that impacts. If you take a look at the view, effectively what I have done is I have excluded my own session ID from the view. Okay, so instead of trying to figure out what locks PG locks is going to take, because PG locks can sometimes vary in what locks it takes, I'm basically creating a new session, I'm running the query in a new session, and I'm excluding any locks that that session itself took. So I'm filtering out that whole PG locks based locking and I'm showing all the external locks to that subsession, that subprocess. Okay? And that's how I'm actually getting rid of, and in fact it says here, do not show our views locks. So I've actually thought of this and that's how I implemented it. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, do you want to do you want to not take locks? Don't use it in a transaction because it might hold locks while you're running. I think I haven't actually looked at that because again, I'm often I'm for this demo, I'm actually excluding main locks. So again, you might want to try this without that exclusion and look to see exactly what locks it's taking. It doesn't take. It basically ends up locking system tables in very in a very light way in an access shared way. So again, you should probably look at that. I didn't actually go into that in presentation, but that's a good point. You don't think it's an issue, right? But I, want, I, I did want to point out that, that I'm, I'm specifically excluding the view of those, and I had to do that to make this presentation understandable, because looking at locks that are based from PG locks itself is just weird, I think. It, it has to be done, but it's... For demo purposes, it's just like way too confusing. Other questions? OK, great. All right. Um, row share, that's our second type of lock. Again, we can uh, use the same uh, sort of clause, the in mode clause to the lock command to specifically row share um, our query, our, our table. So you can see it worked really well. Notice I've gotten the red to the red and the blue to the blue. And this is not an accident. 
um, I tried to make it kind of clear to, so you could kind of understand where these things are coming from. Um, here is an example of row share. Basically, if you use the for share clause on a select, it's going to issue a row share. Okay? Again, you can start to sort of, it doesn't sound like twisty little passages anymore. The names kind of start to make a little sense. A lot of this is education because, again, you have to sort of understand what types of locks are doing what things. Okay? Again, obviously, it's a, it's a row-based query because you're, you're row sharing. It's, you're selecting a row, so it's a row-based type of, of lock. Um, here's, uh, here's this, so this is actually, so here's the, I'm sorry, this is my explicit one, here's my implicit one, row share, um, this is my transaction ID, and actually you start to see a little more stuff here, uh, we actually create an exclusive lock on our own transaction ID, I know this is really weird, and, but, but effectively when a transaction gets assigned, it locks itself, and it locks itself so that other people can wait on its lock to finish, to complete. There's a whole bunch of crazy stuff that I'm, I'm going to be only able to get sort of into at a, at a, at a very high level here. Um, but, but there's a lot of mechanics in the way Postgres works that unfortunately is visible through this lock view. And unless you understand the mechanics, the view doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So um, basically what happens um, is I know that this session is, is 681. And in fact, that is the lock that I'm, I'm actually holding because I've actually been granted the lock on myself. And I've exclusively locked my own transaction ID. And I can see that because it's a transaction ID lock type. Remember how I talked about different relation locks, well, there actually are different lock types as well. Uh, and this is where you start to get into the twisty little passages kind of confusion. Yes? So when you do a select for share and implicitly create that lock, it's going to give you a real transaction ID? Yes, it gives you a real transaction ID. Yeah, yeah. Be and there's some reasons mechanically why we had to do that, because if somebody is waiting to update that row, they're going to need to sleep on your transaction ID. And as soon as your transaction ID goes away, the lock goes away that you held. And then that session knows it can continue processing. If we didn't have a lock on that, there'd be, there'd be nothing for them to sleep on. So it's like we're giving them a pillow to sleep on or a bed to sleep on. Um, and that's really why we lock our own transaction ID. Again, I sort of warn you, I only have 40 minutes. It's going to be a little wild ride. Uh, we're starting to see that. Okay. okay. Um, row exclusive, this is the explicit way of doing it. Uh, very easy, just say row exclusive here. Um, if you issue a delete command on a table, it will do a row exclusive lock on that table. Okay. Again, same exclusive lock of the transaction ID here, because remember that's we had that's what we had from the previous case, um, and now we have a row exclusive lock on that on that table itself. Um, keep in mind there is no, there's nothing in lock view too. This is nothing sophisticated. If you were in, how many people have seen my MVCC talk? Okay, I wish it was more. Um, effectively, Postgres, when it locks a row, actually uses the MVCC visibility uh, columns to mark rows as exclusively locked and share locked. Again, in the time I have, I can't go into this. It is described in my MVCC talk, but effectively, um, you have a case where um, you don't see the row locks because of, we cannot have an unlimited number of row locks somehow stored in a limited amount of shared memory. So the locks are actually stored in the rows themselves, uh, in the data files themselves, not in the memory. You see a marker that there are exclusive row locks for that table, but you don't know what those row locks are because it might be 5 million rows. And by storing the lock information in the table, you don't get the problems of lock table overflow and, and, and you know, sort of serious problems that you used to have with other systems. Uh, again, um, I'm sorry for not being as detailed as I should be. Yeah. Has anybody ever created a, I know there's like no sort of way to make those visible, but has anybody ever created a tool that can inspect them? So has everybody ever created a tool that allows you to inspect them? Um, you don't actually need a tool. Um, if you just do a select on Xmax um, and you actually look at the bits that are in there, you can actually see which rows are exclusive locked. 
Um, if you look at my MVCC talk, it actually shows you an example of looking at the XMAX and actually looking at the bit that tells me that is not really an XMAX, that is a row lock. So look for the, look for the title row lock in the MVCC talk. OK? OK. Uh, another one, share update exclusive. So we had row exclusive, now we have share update exclusive. Uh, this would be the explicit way of doing it. Again, it looks very similar. Um, if you do an analyze, that does a share update exclusive lock on that, um, on that table. It's not a row lock. Okay. Um, and again, I, I, it's, it's beyond the scope of my talk really to go into what each one does. And there is a nice table in the Postgres docs that shows which modes conflict with which modes. So I, I recommend you look at that. Um, as you start to make more, I didn't, improve, I didn't include in this presentation, I thought it would just be like way too head exploding. Um, uh, but, but, but once you start to get going with the locking, and again, that's really the goal of this talk, is to get you going to understand this process. And then once you do, this will help be a springboard, I think, for you to help analyze what's going on in the lock table. Okay, other questions? Okay, great. Um, there is, a, uh, there is a share lock, just called share, um, called share lock. Uh, it's basically the lock that a create index would take. And keep in mind, and I'm sorry about the green if that's not clear, but effectively, um, in this case, I create a unique index and I have a share lock on the table, but I also have an access share lock and an access exclusive lock. One's on the table, one's on something I can't even see, um, and, then I, and then I lock my own transaction ID as well. So again, you can start to see that even a simple command starts to accumulate a number of locks as it goes forward. Okay. Uh, share row exclusive. Um, again, that's the explicit case. Uh, there's an example of it. Uh, if I create a rule, I get an access exclusive lock. Okay. Good. Okay. Exclusive lock. That's kind of the clearest one we've come to so far, I think. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's an exclusive lock on the table. Um, if you issue lock table, that's exactly the mode you get. And in fact, that's the default. Um, I'm sorry, no, this is, this is actually not used by any SQL command. I know it's kind of like, well, you'd think it would be common, but I guess exclusive. It's basically the one that you, you get when you issue that, but you don't, it doesn't happen. Um, actually, no, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that isn't used. It's, the, it's available, but it isn't used. Um, the one you get by default is access exclusive, which... I don't know, my head's spinning at this point. I'm like, I don't know, there's so many names, like what do they all mean? Um, and, and I think it takes some time to kind of get familiar with all these sort of crazy names and behaviors. Um, but effectively, if you, if you issue lock table and you don't use this clause, you get an access exclusive. There, it's actually locking the table. Uh, if you issue the cluster command, that is going to get an access exclusive lock on not only the table, but its index as well. Um, and it's also going to get an access share lock and a share lock. I know it's just like, oh my God, how many locks are here? Um, but effectively, internally, that, and, and you can start to see how, how these locks are basically uh, sort of tied to what Postgres is doing inside. Okay. Um, this is the first table, this is the first type of lock, the cluster, where we actually start to see some locking, um, some information in the lock view two table. And this is actually showing us these exclusive locks right here. The rows are kind of together. So this is row, what, one, two, three, four, and five. Um, or no, actually, it's these two, these top two. Where you don't see anything over here, they're object locks. This is a new type of lock we haven't seen before. Um, and effectively, it's locking the class ID. This is, uh, this is actually the PG class uh, OID. So it's locking PG class, and it's locking a specific um, temporary files. Uh, that are being used for the cluster command itself. Oh, you're starting to see an implementation detail of cluster here. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Okay. Um, so I see that you use my Mhm. Uh, 
Okay, so why, why is this so confusing um, to users? Why isn't there a better interface? Part of it is historical because we kind of defined it that way. We didn't really think of a pretty user interface for it. Part of it is that this stuff is just really confusing and complex, and there is not a real simple way of doing it. I mean, I'm barely scratching the surface here, and, and I'm not sure that I could actually present a coherent way. The view kind of helps, um, but even then I'm thinking it's still confusing. I Basically, I'm not sure what I'd recommend people to do. Uh, so that was the question. Can we make this prettier? I'd love to brainstorm about that. I personally don't have any ideas on it, except the view that I came up with, which even then I'm not sure how big an improvement is over what we have. Okay. Lock examples. This is sort of the meat of the talk. I'm going to actually show you some examples of us using uh, locking in real world queries. Um, again, this is um, some locks on a bridge. I don't know what that is, uh, but it's very common. Uh, locks are, first of all, row locks are not visible in PG locks. I already alluded to this. Um, here's an example where I, I insert a row. Uh, I get a row exclusive lock on that particular row uh, because it is uh, an uncommitted transaction. Okay? Uh, if I actually insert two more rows, so I've inserted three rows now. So I insert one row and I see one lock here. Okay? I insert two more rows, I still have one lock. So that, I'm trying to kind of make it clear to you. you could, if you lock 1,000 rows, we're not going to see 1,000 rows in this lock table. We see one. Because as I said before, the lock information is stored on the row, not actually in the lock table itself. And again, that's done so that you can scale to millions or billions of locks without overflowing, without sort of lock table overflow, which I remember it being a problem with many commercial systems. Okay? Uh, so it's a very elegant system. Again, MVCC kind of explains, my MVCC talk kind of explains it. Um, Update also causes an index to lock. Here's a case where we're actually updating um, a particular column. Uh, but keep in mind that I've actually, because I've got a unique index on this field, an, in, an update not only does it lock the row, but it actually locks the index row associated with that particular case. And um, so you're just seeing that the, it can actually cascade the indexes as well. Yeah. Okay, so that's a great question. Do the row locks that we do the locks that we write on the rows spill to disk? In fact, they do spill to disk. Um, it, it's um, are they write ahead logged? The they are not write ahead logged unless you are uh, doing prepared transactions. Um, because there's no reason to because yeah, we could throw it away because we don't care. Yeah, that kind of thing. I'm not positive about that. I don't think we wrote write wrote. I don't think we will log the locks because I don't think they're that important. I, I believe that's right. Um, another issue, uh, if we do two updates, uh, keep in mind we also don't increase the number of locks. Okay, so I've now updated three rows. I still have two, I still have two locks. Okay, go again, the, the concept that you're going to see thousands of rows here for 1,000 updates is, again, not, not going to happen. There's a, there's a very minimalistic, and I think, frankly, that's part of the reason it's hard to understand. It's a very minimalistic system that Postgres is used for lock recording. So there's not a whole lot of information to show you, because a lot of it is pushed into places where we can scale better. So uh, that's why you're looking through like a, you know, like a, you're looking through like a slit in a tank, you know, <laughs> just getting a little view of what's going on because Postgres is, is going to push a lot of this stuff not stored in shared memory because a lot of this, we don't want to limit ourselves in, in how we behave. Um, if we delete a row, we get a similar type of lock behavior. Uh, if we delete, um, now, if we delete, if we, if we delete one row, we get similar to Hable. If we re delete all the rows, again, we don't have an increase in the number of locks sh stored here. Explicit row locks are similar. If I lock one row, I only have one right here. If I lock all of the rows, again, I don't see any change. So uh, basically trying to sort of talk about the same thing with a four share lock. Four share locks are not going to create. I've actually locked three rows here. I don't have any more extra cases. OK? OK. Uh, let me restore the lock table so we can kind of get started again. Um, this is an issue that I go into great detail in my MVCC talk. 
Um, updates are not by, the blocked by select. So here I do a select. Uh, I can see the row. The X min is actually a field in the system that's used by MBCC. Um, if I then look at my own transaction ID and I then do a select, you can see that um, I basically have my normal locks. I have not, just because I did an, just because I do an update, um, I actually don't get a whole lot more locks. This is the second session. Uh, this is the first session, but again, you can see you're not. You're not doing a whole bunch of locks. This is the, the new row. Um, but so again, you can see that a, a, an update can keep going even though somebody has actually uh, done a select on the same table. That's one of the features of uh, MACC. OK, destroy the table again. Uh, two, uh, two concurrent updates. Uh, here I'm updating one row. Um, here I'm actually looking at the new row. Um, here's my process ID. Here's my transaction ID. Uh, here, I'm doing a second update on that row. Now, here's the first case where you're going to see some blocking. Because as you notice right here, this granted field, which was showing true for every case, is now showing false. Okay. So what is happening is, in MVCC, again, selects don't block updates, but one update can block another update. So what you see in this example are two sessions. Here's the first session, 11306. Here's the second session, 11557. You see that right here? That's the breakpoint. Okay. They have similar locks, access share, access share. Okay. Now the problem is that this lock is actually waiting, this session down here is waiting on this transaction ID to complete. Do you remember I said earlier that the reason we take a lock on our own transaction is so people have somewhere to sleep? That's exactly what we're doing here. This unfulfilled lock is waiting for this transaction to complete. So it'll go to sleep. When the transaction completes, that session will be woken up and will be allowed to continue its, um, its process. Yes? The second number increments. So the virtual transaction ID, the first number doesn't change. The second number changes. But because we prefixed it by the slot number, we can increase that without locking anything. So the reason it's a two-parter is so that we can increase our virtual transaction IDs without having to lock anything among the other sessions. Is, that's why we did it that way. Because the global pool of transactions, the, 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 the non-virtual external transaction IDs do require some locking to be assigned. Because it's, a, it's one counter, basically. It has to be shared by everybody. OK. So that's, again, our first case where we're actually waiting on something. Um, we actually can even see the row that it's waiting on. So this is actually page 0. Um, uh, this is the uh, item pointer, item pointer number 10. Uh, so this is actually, this is uh, lock view 2. So this is, we actually can see the one row that's sleeping on. We don't, show the, we don't show the locks that we did, but the, we can only sleep on one row, so we can actually put that information here. Okay. Um, and once, once the first session completes, the second session runs. Okay. So effectively, you can see this uh, transaction ID, which is right here. Um, once this ends, this completes, and you can see transaction uh, 11575 has completed, has gotten its lock, and it's done. OK, so it blocked, it waited, the other one finished. I have some sleeps in here to kind of make it work really well. Uh, that, was, that was not trivial to do, but it worked. OK, three concurrent updates. So here I've actually created a, uh, a view, a new view. Uh, the view is actually um, a union, a recursive view with a union in it. Okay, again, uh, I'm sorry if that's complicated, but that was the only way we could do it. Um, here's a, another part of the view. It's actually two recursive queries together. Um, but what it allows me to show you is that if I do three concurrent updates, uh, this row, update this row, update this row, and I run these updates so they all block each other. You can actually see a fairly sizable table. 702 is the first transaction. 703 is sleeping on it. And then it turns out that 704 and 705 
end up sleeping kind of on this guy. I know it's really confusing, but there's only one. Once you have multiple people sleeping on something, Postgres doesn't track that information. Uh, it actually stores it out here. So you can actually see all three of these transactions are actually sleeping on this guy. But these don't have transaction IDs, because this is the one that's going to get woken up. And these other guys are in line. So the in line guys aren't getting the real transaction to sleep on. They're just like going to sleep. But we have information here of what they're sleeping on. So we can, once the first guy finishes and we run the second guy, we can actually assign, we can actually assign the next person in line to be the waiter. Okay? Um, and again, this is kind of a case where you're looking at, yeah, this guy has the, the, the transaction, and these guys are actually waiting now on that transaction. So that, this is actually the view that I wanted to show you that's the recursive one, uh, which actually shows you a better presentation of all the transactions. Um, and then you can see these people waiting on, on this particular. You can see them all have, all three of them, one, one of them has the lock, and the other two are waiting. Um, and again, this one is waiting on that one, and these guys are just kind of like hanging there, basically. Okay, it's really complicated. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then once it finishes, you can see this person. Uh, 702 is completed. 703 now has the lock. Now 704 is waiting on 703. Okay. And actually, this guy's waiting on 703 too. So I'm not sure why that happened, but I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, deadlocks. I want to show you this example. I'm not going to go into what a deadlock is. I hope you know. Um, here I have two rows uh, that would, uh, would deadlock each other, uh, 50 to 50, 100 to 100. Uh, again, I just increment them. Uh, this is actually a deadlock example. So here I have 710. Oh, no, this is not deadlock yet. So 710, 711 is waiting on 710. That's fine. Uh, there's the row it's waiting on. I then do some more activity. This is where I start my deadlock. And this is actually a deadlock display right here. OK? Uh, 710 is waiting on 711. 711 is waiting on 710. As far as I know, this is the first time we've actually shown a deadlock in the locks table. First time I've seen it, at least. OK? It is possible to do this uh, for a three-way deadlock. Um, I'm not going to sort of bore you with the queries. Uh, but here actually is a three-way deadlock. 714 to 716, 715 to 714, and 716 to 715. OK? Cool? OK. I am running out of time. I don't have any time for questions. Uh, let's restore the table. Uh, serializability has its own lock type. Um, it's actually uh, called an SI read lock. That's a special uh, new 9-1 feature for our serializable friends. Uh, Kevin Grittner can explain what that does, but you, it will show up in the lock table. Uh, if you do an insert unique, it will actually lock and wait for that um, insert to finish. So again, if you try and update an in, a unique index, uh, you can actually see that waiting happening right here. Subtransactions, uh, those actually also create um, uh, their own lock cases. So I've actually used a save point here. Uh, and you can see 720, 724, 723, 725. Uh, you can see basically it's, it's incrementing there. Uh, unique inserts, again, um, same kind of case. You can block waiting for that. Okay. Advisory locks, there is an advisory lock command in Postgres. Um, it actually shows up as lock type advisory. And again, um, it will show up in the lock views. And then you can unlock if you want. You can, uh, just to finish up, we did talk about joining the PG locks table and the PG stat activity table. This allows you to see not only the locks, but the query that goes with it. Um, this is an example of a view I created to kind of make it easier. Uh, and this is actually what it displays like. I know it's really hard to read. But again, you can see the transactions here. You can see the queries, and then you can see the locks that go with it. Uh, OK. So that's all I want to talk about. Sorry, I've gone three minutes over. Um, the next session does start at 11.30. I don't have time for questions, unfortunately. I will be up here if you have any uh, questions of me specifically. Hope you're enjoying the conference. Thank you. <laughs>